Welcome back to Big Content. We have someone new in the chair over there. That's not Jack Settleman. That's probably what you're asking yourself right now. Jack is out of the country. He's on a boat somewhere in the middle of nowhere with no internet, or so he says. I think it's a lack of work ethic, but here we are nonetheless, and we're showing up, and that right there is JL, John Luke, otherwise known as the CTO of BDGE, amongst many other things at this point in his prestigious life, and I thought he was in town, originally from, or lives in Baltimore, and comes to New York once a month or so, because he's part of the team, obviously, and uh, we work together while he's here, and I thought, let's film, let's get something on paper. Get something on the screen. Papper. And let's <laughs> some papper. <laughs> let's sort up his big content. So I think what we're gonna do today, we didn't come in with like a uh, a very divisive plan, but given our strengths and given the yin and yang that I think we have together, we will probably focus a lot of the conversation on creatorship, of course, because it's big content, plus the idea of product and how to push product into whatever you're building and how to think about product maybe from a different angle than a lot of you guys are used to. I think a lot of people are probably thinking of product from a physical standpoint, you know, merch is a product building out any physical product is a fucking product. Obviously you could also build software products, you know, tools that your audience uses, all those types of things are different products. But I think the general theme over the next decade or so, and this was a prediction I made in the prediction episode a couple of weeks ago was basically that creators are, are going to start probably fixating on the idea of, of product, you know, working with product people, working with tech people to kind of think about their ideas and make them into a reality. And the reason for that is because it would start to separate them from the middleman of what a normal creator is right now, where they're finding themselves slaves to the algorithm, to the platforms. And more importantly, if they want to make money to the advertisers and the sponsors, I think we'll see a big shift away from that type of behavior because they're out of leverage in that situation. And when you start to build something internally and go straight to your audience, you build up that leverage where you are financially free and it allows you to build something like, you know, from within, from your heart and say, Hey, I want to make this a real thing. I want to give it right to my audience. And like, that's a pure, pure, pure connection. So dialing back a little bit, like Jell, you've, you've been on the content side of things more recently, but your background is on the product side of things. Right. You've worked in a few different companies within the, fantasy and, and gambling and football space up to this point. You also run your own brand front yard fantasy. Uh, give us a quick like background on how you got to be so heavily involved in the product space. Like what was the idea behind getting into product? Like wh why are you passionate about it? Like what is, you know, quick JL I'm quick, here. Quick JL. Who the fuck am I? Yeah. Ooh, who am I? Yeah. I think, I don't think I liked product until I was doing it for a while. Let's take a second. Let's define what product is. I was is about first. to ask you, yeah. what, is, what is product to you? To me, it's, it's something that you sell that isn't attached to your time. When you're, even as a content creator, your, your time is somewhat attached to the, pro the product you're creating. And content is a product, but it's something that it's, a, it's an artifact that you're delivering that isn't yourself or you showing up to do work in that moment. It's something that you can scale you can do the work once and then sell it or sell, you know, scale it. So is that the hard line between product and service? Is that the differentiator? Yes. Yep. Okay. Interesting. I don't think I've ever heard it put that way. Yeah. Service is like it, you're essentially showing up to do something, right? It's, hey, we have already solved these problems. We can do it really well. We're going to we'll solve them for you for a price. That's how you look at product. I look at it the same way. I have not been around it my whole life, so I don't. I don't think I use my time to try to define it or put it into a label. I don't think I need to at this point, but it's been fun working with you from the sense of how you think about product versus how I think about content. Yeah. Right. And that's one thing I've learned from you. And it was something we were just talking about how content we, we can get so experimental in here with content and come out with new varying ways of it because it's low risk, right? right? If something goes wrong, it's not a big deal. Product is something that you, you know, when you, when you put out a product, it's, it's, it's work. It's, it's months and months and months of work for the most part. And each decision has so many different factors to it with the UI, the UX, and that doesn't always need to be like technical. It's like UI and UX is uh, something that's creative part of every, uh, every product too, like yeah. physical products, whatever. So it's a little bit higher risk because 
right. you're investing way more into it. And I think that's something that I learned with you. It's like, I'm impatient because I'm so used to immediate feedback on content and being like, I could switch it like that. Right. Where yours, like, we got to think about this. What are the long-term ramifications of what we're doing with this product? And that's, that's, that, that's probably the first thing I noticed working with you. Yeah. I think that, I think that's very telling about what we have seen from our respective perspectives here in the pitfalls that you experience either as an early creator or an early product maker. Uh, for product, it's often that you don't, you overanalyze it, you over engineer it, right? Classic joke among software engineers is like, they'll spend hours and hours and hours just refining, like cleaning this code that do, like doesn't actually impact anything. For content, on the other end of it, you are, it makes sense to be quick because there's so much content out there and there's just more of it. And so you being out there more, more frequently gets in front of your audience more. It's like a different value prop and it's a different type of way you create it. And I, uh, on the other end, have learned from working with you on where there's overlap between the two. I feel like that's been the most telling part since we started working together. It's just like, they're different product and content, how you make them. But I think it's just nuance. I don't think, I think like fundamentally they're largely the same thing. And you're also one of the few dudes in the space, I think, realistically, that can attach both of those things to your name and say, I'm both someone who's done a heavy amount of content and a heavy amount of product. That's fucked me up for a while though. Yeah. Like figuring out how to present that in a, I, I don't, my background isn't in marketing. Uh, and so that figuring out how to present that, uh, that identity, or even within myself, like what my content guy, my product guy, uh, has been difficult and challenging. Why do you feel like you need to define who you are? I think that's part of building a personal brand is, is communicating to people what you have to offer. But you have both. Right. So it's like, why do you need to decide which one you have when you have both? It's, oh, not deciding which, one I, which ones I have, but more so deciding how to communicate it or how to market it. That's very clear to me that you want to, and this is a good topic, I think, for this audience, because it's a lot of people who are in the journey of building their personal brand, and they're being held back by this, whatever it is, you know, some, yep. some, something within them that does not allow them to express themselves correctly. And you're worried about your communication being off when you're not even communicating yet. I think anytime you do something and you share it with the world, you have an intent with it. You have some some reason why you're doing that. You don't always know it. With product, you have to have that intent a little bit more fleshed out ahead of time because you can't really like code ambiguity or like a vague algorithm, mm -hmm. right? The computer just won't do it. Uh, you have to be very specific. And so like it takes a lot of time to kind of figure that, that those pre-steps out in order to, once you get to the actual building of it, it should be a little bit more concrete. But with content, it feels like, and with personal branding, sometimes it feels like you're, you got to jump before there's anything there mm -hmm. and then figure it out. That's, that's what I was going to say is like, this almost feels like the little, a little bit of the mindset we were talking about where you're thinking about product more long term, long term, like, Hey, we need to build this correctly. Right. Cause, cause there might be some risk behind it. And in my mind, I'm just like, just fucking make a video. You know what I mean? Like, I'm yeah. just like, make the thing, and you'll figure out the right way to do it. Whereas product is like, yeah, we need to figure out the right way to do it before we really build the thing and have the infrastructure for it. But I think that's one of the things I, I struggle with is not, not perfectionism. I don't care. I am not worried about a video being perfect ever. I don't think that'll ever slow me down. I do worry about consistency of delivery. I don't like starting something content wise, not because I'm worried about the first one being bad, but I'm worried about, okay, if I promise to do this once a week, and I don't get to do it, that fucks me up a little bit, you know? So what line do you see for yourself as perfectionism versus like something like the consistency versus what do you, what do you think it is really holding you back there? And is it because you have that high risk mindset? You feel like all these decisions you make outward are like high risk. I don't think they're high risk. I think I logically understand that they're, they're low risk, that there's no real mm -hmm. danger that I'm in because I've, I've done the, action a bunch of times mm -hmm. already right i've created tons of content around fantasy football around football 
in general. But ever by yourself? Not primarily by myself most of the time. I have done ones by myself. It wasn't that pure expression. I, yeah, I, I don't think it's, I don't think in that case, it's necessarily fear of the act or fear of looking bad. It's more so like I already have somewhat of a brand that I've built up over these four years I've been in this industry. How to, like figuring out what I want to say and which of the areas of interest or things that I've learned or like which of those pieces is worth sharing and which of those audiences is, is worth sharing so that when I do it, it feels like I'm doing it for a purpose and not just for the, pro- the, the purpose of doing it. You know what I think I've realized too? And I, t- I talk about this a lot on internally with us when we're choosing the different channels that we want to start making content for. I think that we're so heavily involved in YouTube. I, I think it's good to separate everything be like this is passion one passion two topic one topic two topic three topic four i think youtube specifically that's unbelievably important for i don't think on platforms like twitter or other platforms that it's that big of a deal but i actually think it's we've been kind of bad at shifting our mindset from like really being native from platform to platform for instance if you think about people you follow on twitter like alex ramosi like if he tweets out a video of him like talking about nutrition or food or something you're not going to be like, what the fuck? You know what I mean? Like th- he has many, many, pa- like many people have many passions. Yeah. And I like, like if I subscribe to a YouTube channel and they're all over the place, I'm like, fuck that. If I'm following someone on Twitter, I'm like, cool. It's just like chill, like a, a place where people can get off their thoughts at all times. So I think it is native to a platform. So I would say like YouTube channel, definitely specific. I think for like Twitter, I think it's good for you to share multiple vantage points and you can make videos about different things and tweet things about different things. Like, I'm in fantasy football. Our our channel is the BDG channel is 99.9% of the things I put on that channel are fantasy football. I would say 5% of the tweets that I make are fantasy football related, you know? So it's like, you almost have to take yourself out of the mindset of going channel to channel and understanding what the, I guess, purpose is for it. So I don't, I don't necessarily think that everything needs to have a purpose, but I also would maybe challenge you to go back to the question I asked you a couple of days ago, where it's like, if you knew for sure that you're going to start making content tomorrow and in 10 years, you're going to be successful as fuck for that type of content. What content would you make? Like, what do you want to be successful and known for? And that I feel like is usually the right answer to the content you should start making now. Yeah. I, I think that's a great question. It separates the money. It's not like you're going to make a bunch of money. It's like, you know, you're going to, a million people are going to know you for this type of content. What do I want to be known for? Right. What is it? What is it going to give me that energy when I when I create it? Mm-hmm. And I think I I've had that a taste of that feeling enough times now that the lack of it is uh, like m- m- feels so strongly when I feel it. Right. Nice. It's like oh this is this is brutal. Like, I don't I don't want to create this or I don't feel like I'm saying like I'm speaking uh, as myself right or authentically. And when you find those little overlaps where it is that thing, it's like, whoa, yeah. this is so easy. I could do this forever. And that question, I think, does help me cut out some of those options. It doesn't fully make it clear which, uh, like, the full path ahead. I think the reason for that is that is a lack of clarity on my end, right? Like, I haven't figured out which of those interests is the most va- important to me or the one that, I, you know, is the underlying topic I want to talk about. I think there's a lot of value to making content about a lot of different topics at first, especially because more often than not, you'll find some sort of bump that'll get you going and some sort of indicator that's like, this is the right path. You might put out a video that, you know, randomly goes off for 10,000 views. and You're like, okay, this is like probably where I need to be. Or you might just find one and be like, I fucking enjoy the shit out of this. Like, this is where I want to be kind of thing. Right. So I think when you're starting off, like it's probably important to experiment. Some creators know exactly what they want to talk about, which is a really good spot to be in. Because I think like once you do that, all you got to do is put the work in, man. Right. Just fucking make the videos over right. and over and over and put the work in and research and, and, and make notes and, and all that kind of stuff. You that know? sounds delightful. Like no, I feel like the uncertainty part of it is the thing that really is just fucking brutal to creators. Yeah. Figuring out what what is what am I supposed to do? What am I supposed to say? Like, what, what? what do I want to say? Yeah, I got new, I got news for you. There's not going to be a sign from God. You just got to do. Got to you know? do it, yeah. I think a lot of, like, mental cloudiness comes from a lack of action. I, anytime I find myself in, like, a really bad mental rut or mental fog, pen to paper, just getting into action and executing tends to start clearing things up. Yeah, you. I remember we talked about this before I started at BG, where it's just, like, a 
random conversation we were having over the summer. And going into working here, I was dealing with a lot of that anxiety of just feeling overwhelmed with too many things going on, not having enough time to deal with it all. Uh, and you mentioned that exact point of that, you know, action will create that clarity. And so I kind of like, even though I, I logically agreed with you, I was still in the middle of it. And uh, I, the way I, I went about that, I was like, all right, well, like, let me see if that's the case. Let me test that out for myself. And so that's like the first three months I worked here, I really like tried to force myself into that mindset of just like anything I felt anxiety around, let me apply this like Nick rule. I looked at, you know, where the outcome of what I was looking for. And then I worked backwards from there and focus on the actions. And yeah, you're spot on. I think that does help a ton. I think it doesn't help in every situation. And that is probably because the, like the problem in the two situations is different. So I think, I think in some cases it is, it is avoiding a task or avoiding action because of some fear or some other psychological thing. Other times I think it's that the action itself isn't right. Right. You, you either don't understand why you're doing it or you have assumptions that are incorrect uh, about what doing it will actually do for you at mm. the end. I wouldn't argue because I don't know what, <laughs> what side of the argument I would take. Because <laughs> I don't understand you. <laughs> but, I, but I would say what you said at the, at the second part, I, w I wonder if those two things give you different types of anxiety, though. Like the first one gives you the anxiety where action helps debilitate that. Where the second thing, I almost feel like the second it's like way you put it maybe. is more like lack of priorities. would give me frustration more than anxiety. Mm. It's oh. like, you know, you're doing the wrong thing. It's not anxiety. It's like, uh, it's like frustration, which eventually probably does lead back to anxiety in a sense. Yeah. It could be also like, like unconscious. Yeah. Right. So like if you're, most you of mine, I find like, I know, sorry to interrupt, but like, I find this pattern with me personally is like, if I sleep poorly, like there, 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 there will be stretches in my life where I'll sleep really poorly for like four or five nights in a row. It's like, it's a bad sleep. And I'm like, what is happening to me? That is, it tr and it took me damn near 30 years to understand that <clears throat> like almost up until the last like two years year when that happens i'm like i have serious subconscious anxiety about something yep and that's when that's when i know i have to put action into something that's when i know i have to i have to have hard conversations with people and that's usually what it leads to it's like i'm not going down the right path right now and it's because i'm too afraid to have to do the tough thing right. in my life i think that that right there which you just described that little like antenna essentially that you have that you something like you noticed uh something's not right now i need to apply this tactic mm -hmm. of action in this situation to remedy this i think that is the piece that a lot of creators are missing is that they don't necessarily have the con the tactic or the context to understand that that tactic's going to be the thing to solve it so they just have the frustration and anxiety and they might be somewhat conscious or aware of it but i for me it, i had to sit there and like feel that discomfort and just keep trying keep trying keep trying until i learned it until i learned the lesson yeah same yeah there's no other way <laughs> you know there's no other way to learn it just like fucking clueless and a lot of it is you like you're trying to figure out your life you know yeah. so it's like there's not a lot of solves to it but I would say the more that you align yourself with the things that you care about and the people that give you energy and good people around you that are also on the same path as you, the more you will just feel aligned in general in life. And that has alleviated a lot of the anxiety I've had. Yeah. It's like that. Um, you ever play any of those video games where it's like you have to like pick a lock or something and you have to use like the toggle stick to get it just in the right spot and it'll kind of give you like a visual indicator. Yeah. I feel like Bioshock was kind of like that yeah, or something. Bioshock. So good. Somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> that was oh. that theme song right for it i think so yeah. i was like i think in the commercial that they would have for it yeah i remember that yeah thing. few games are like create such an entire vibe like bioshock yeah it's just BioShock like was sick. put you right back into that time frame you ever thought about going down the video game oh, yeah. path oh not, okay. not playing but like creating? creating yeah that was why i started programming was i wanted to be a video game designer Okay. So I th I'm super into video games in high school, and I thought I would, that's Fucking what I want to do. So I know. <laughs> I know. What are your favorite games in high school? Gears of War was definitely, like, my One of the my dudes OG. I'm going to dinner with tonight, we used to post up at his house and play fucking Gears for, for do, days on do that. Do some no-scope? No I was terrible. 
I was always bad at the shooter games. They pissed me the fuck <laughs> off. Because you suck. They pissed me <laughs> off. <laughs> Hated them shits. Oh, man. I wish we could play Gears So right now, now I stick to real games like fantasy football. <laughs> <laughs> like single player DFS. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, okay, sorry. Yeah, so you you got into programming because of that. Because of video games, yeah. The, the parallel I was trying to make with that analogy oh, was, right. was that... Uh, was that that's kind of what this feels like trying to figure out what you want to do with your life or what your voice is or if you're ambitious, like where to put that energy. It kind of feels like that type of video game where, you're, you know, you can only really like you don't have you can't see, but you can really only just feel while you go. And when you're feeling around, you get like those really strong that strong feedback like oh this is this is the right person or this is the right thing that is the key i found and that's kind of, kind of what it feels like and that's what i feel like i've been looking for do you have any like practical advice for someone searching to try to find that pull because i'm gonna be honest i don't i don't have a lot of like great advice for that like the only advice i give is like just keep experimenting and keep trying new things i don't have a lot of great advice because i was very fortunate that i feel like at a young age relatively young you know i was like this is what i fucking love and i'm just you found it early that's yeah. it yeah like you know and I, I know a lot of people don't really relate to that so it's easy for me to be like just make the shit just make the shit just work 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 is like really that's it like once you find the thing it's just about putting the work for fucking years on end but i yeah the whole experimenting part i can imagine is frustrating as shit yeah i don't think it i, I think you are on the very other end of the spectrum yeah. in that like even now i think i've been on the right path for my career i'm 29 now and I feel like I'm just really now getting even close to figuring out exactly what it is. I've been on been on the trail, you know. Like I knew I let I got into software, did that for a few like few. Uh, got my undergrad in that, went and worked at a startup, but was well, as a software engineer, so was, you know, very technical, and then moved into entrepreneurship and pro, you know, product management, and then content. And in doing those those three things, I think it, each of those moves was in an effort to get closer to that thing, that getting closer to where yeah. it felt fully me, right? It's full. This is what I want to do, and I've gone down some paths where I was like, "Wow, like this does, like content, and like uh, doing like improv and performing." I was like, "Wow, this is like, like I might have gone down this path if I had done this earlier." Mm-hmm. Like I, it's spe- you know, it's it's so natural or feels so good. Uh, video is the same thing. Like I was really into video in high school and I wanted to go to film school and my parents talked me out of it. And damn, now, damn and, them. And I like full circled back to it, but not fully intentionally. It just kind of happened that way. Yeah. That's the other thing too. It's like you go searching for it. I feel like you're not going to find it. I feel like everything I've fallen in love with has been so random yeah. and I had no idea that, that it was going to happen. It wasn't like, I'm going to try this thing and hopefully I like it. Oh, I tried it. I like this. Let me keep doing yeah. it. It's always some fucking random thing. So I will say, one piece of advice that I, I do feel like could probably help a lot of people is most people are scared of stopping doing things. So I think you can figure out stuff you dislike way faster than you can figure out stuff you like. Yep. So as soon as you're like, I fucking hate this, bro, brother, you got one life. Like, stop doing that shit. You know yes. what I mean? Yeah. Like that, that is one. Pa- like, you, you continue to pile up things that you dislike, and it'll eventually lead you down a right path, I think. It's that, and I, to do that, you got to have some self-awareness, yes. right, to just be able to stop whatever you're doing, look, like, and think about how you're feeling in that moment and be like, all right, I really like making these videos. I don't like the whole part about making these videos, but I, I generally like making these videos. I feel driven to do this. What pieces of that process do you like? What would pieces feel like time slips away and you're just in it, right? And which pieces feel like you are in a nine to five grueling job and each of those pieces just like write down and then yeah, the, the experiment just becomes do that as frequently as you can, right? Like That's what life is, yeah. Find what you like, do it as frequently as you can, and you live life. <laughs> but most people don't do the experiment part. They, they stick to the one thing. They or don't. Th- yeah, or they don't, they don't gather the results of the experiments they run, right? They just act That's, that's where that. your product mind comes in. That's where the product mind comes in, yeah. But even like on a grander scale of finding things that you don't like, that starts at a young ass age. Like you're put in college and they're expecting you to know what the fuck you want to do for the rest of your life at age 18. And it's okay to push back on the fact that you don't know what you want to do. And it's okay to push back on you not knowing what you want to do until any fucking age. You could be 30, you could be 35, you could be 40. 
still not understand what you want to do. A lot of people, I think, can't stand up for themselves, though. I think yep. they can't combine the self-awareness of understanding what they like and then also being able to be externally aware of saying, like, this is what I want to do. I don't care about the judgment of other people. Like, that's a lot easier said than done, right? You're 30, 35 years old. You got yourself in into a job that you fucking hate, right? You can't quit because X, Y, Z, because this person's going to say something, because your family's going to make fun of you. Some cost fallacy. All that yeah. kind of stuff is is just noise. It's realistically not real. I'm sure a lot of people have families in which they need to think about other options, but there are ways out of those situations for sure. You know, that takes a little bit of pen to paper, planning how much I had to save up in order to make a jump, et cetera. These are all realistic options. And yeah. I think most people are scared to take these realistic options because of outside noise and outside judgment. Yeah. And, yeah. I, ho- and I hope like these types of conversations and podcasts like make people feel a little bit more seen and welcomed and more like, oh, I do relate to other people. Yeah, that that has been such a key lesson in this whole thing is that like other <laughs> other people's opinion just doesn't, it doesn't matter as much as as you think. I've, and that was such, I, it seems so obvious being on the other side of the lesson, but you don't realize how much that is baked into your subconscious from oh, yeah. from the moment you're born. Oh, you should be doing this. You should be doing that. You should be doing this. In reality, like no one has the time to pay attention to anybody else. Like I can I can barely keep up with all of the shit that like just the ten closest people in my life have going on. I, I genuinely wonder what a, what the world would look like if. No one actually cared what other people think. I think there are so few people that actually don't care what other people think. Or like, even if we're on the other side of it, still like 40% I care what other people oh, yeah. think. And that still. probably number is probably low. Most people are probably sitting between like 95 and 99% of caring about what other yeah, people yeah. think. In a world where nobody cared, it would probably be a really cool place. It would just be creative expression all the time, I truly believe. And that's actually like the thesis of what I want at BDG is to create the internal workings of a place where people feel safe to create and express themselves themselves because it takes the judgment zone out of it. That is the thesis behind the office space. Yeah. And I, I I love that thesis and I think you're right. I think the big thesis guy, big big thesis, new channel coming soon. (laughs) Big (laughs) thesis. Hi. Yeah. I think you're, I think you're absolutely right. One thing I try to do when I notice that it's creeping into that, my subconscious thought, because I'll notice it's just a walking down the street, right? Like I'm, I'm walking past somebody and I'm all of a sudden I start to feel like the, like an intense intensity of energy in my body where it's like, I all of a sudden feel like I have to start managing the interaction. And I, I just, whenever I notice that I stop myself and I think is what, however this person feels about me going to impact my life, like the outcome of my life or, or my life in any material way. Yeah. And if the answer to that is no, I stop thinking about it and I just go back to like meditation essentially and just recenter on whatever I want to think about or, you know, I go back to quiet and then let my brain go. Yeah. Where do you find yourself in that state most often worrying about other people? I think my answer is is twofold to this one. I think one is when I'm doing that intentionally versus unintentionally. Because I, I think I feel that way probably the most intentionally when I'm at like a conference or something like that. Somewhere where I'm almost like, or on a show, right? It's like I'm, I'm, I'm on, right? I'm, I'm focusing my energy to put it, put it outwards in through what I'm saying and, and how I'm acting and how I'm interacting. That is a, a learned skill where I think you're asking, correct me if I'm wrong, is unintentionally where do I feel that the most? Yeah. Like where, is that, where is that naturally just kind of come up? I think a lot of times it's it's uh, it's more like public settings where the interactions are tra- more transactional or less. It's less clear to be able to make genuine connections because that's that to me is easy connecting one on one with people. But where it's a situation like you know, it's like you have to impress a person. Yeah, like yeah. you know, I don't know, even just like passing someone attractive on the street, right? Like it, like mm-hmm. I, it like naturally will pop out versus just connecting with a friend or something. I don't think. Yeah. What about internet versus real life? Because I would say for me personally, and maybe that's held me back as a creator in some aspect or another, I'm sure it has. But I think the the 99% of people who are stuck at, at being a creator or don't really know where to go, a lot of it, again, stems from being worried about judgment, I think. For me, I think anytime I feel uncomfortable or in that state, it's almost always in real life or in public. 
Really? Like, yeah, the internet to me is like, I don't know. Uh, like believe land? But pretty much. I've gotten to the point where we're so at, uh, this sound douchey, but like we're so at scale in terms of like the number of comments we get a day on like our collective uh, content that like to me, it's just robots out there. It yeah. really, really kind of is. And obviously, I have relationships with some people in them, but like you get to a point where you learn the behavior at scale of people and you're like these the, the what they're saying is not real like Deion Sanders said it best is like you didn't make me so you can't break me like, yeah you know it's like you did nothing to build to who I am so like what you're saying it's not really mean much to me I think that's probably a lesson you could take anywhere but yeah the internet just doesn't really get to me because I've realized like you'll you will genuinely never like when something happens uncomfortable in real life you could say like, "Oh, I'm never going to meet that person again," but it's, you're still face to face with them in that moment. Physically, yeah. But in the internet, like you are literally never going to cr- come across these people, probably. Yeah, it's a good point. I do feel like that the permanence of the internet can create a little bit of enhancing mm. on the on the fear of that that like whatever I say is out there and it has my name on it now yeah. versus in person. I I just be like, "Oh no, that person was that was they were the weird one. It wasn't me." <laughs> yeah. I guess the way I look at it is like as long as I say true about everything. As long right. as like what I'm saying is true and I'm not lying about anything on the internet. Right. I never have to look over my shoulder on right. the internet. Right. You know what I mean? You yeah. could dislike what I said and it could be on record something you disagree with, but if I believed it, I don't give a fuck that it's out there. And I think that's where we get into like the nuance of care like where I think most people you talk to, if you ask them if they're afraid of what other people think, they'll tell you no. They're not afraid. Mm-hmm. And I think what you just hit on is the reason why they're wrong. <laughs> it's it's almost like the what they're saying or presenting doesn't match up with who they think they should be in mm-hmm. their head. And it creates then a cognitive dissonance of like, this doesn't match or this isn't me. Yeah, dude, we're, we live in a world where everything is just on a pedestal. We're yeah. like, people... F- they just see so many people on a daily basis just Killing through their <laughs> just through their screens that they feel like they're supposed to be something it's kind of nauseating when i think about it and it was like a question that i asked or that i answered in the big content q and a last week someone asked like what would you do with the first $10,000 you made mm-hmm. and by the end of it i was like it's also okay to not spend it if you feel comfortable yeah, I remember that more part. comfortable with the 10,000 in your bank there doesn't need to be a right way just because you, just because I said you, this is what you're supposed to do, but like you got to be able to turn it back internally and be like, ah, I feel really safe with the 10k here. Maybe something inspires you to spend it or whatever the case may be, but I feel like that's how the world operates now at scale, where people have a really, really. I th- I think the same question, or I think if you ask people like, okay, do you care about what other people think? They say no. I think if you asked everyone if they're self aware, how many people are gonna say no? I'm not self aware. <laughs> yeah, no. <I'm> not. Com- <laughs> No Com- lights on in compared, there, Yeah, compared to how many people actually are self-aware. Yeah. And I, I think we are all all of us. Like, I don't think I'm as self-aware as I think I probably am. Yeah. You likewise, know what I mean? Yeah. And I, I think self-awareness comes from, like, a really deep understanding of who you are. And if you really were self-aware, you would align your actions with that. And so many people, like, don't respect themselves enough to, like, really align their actions with who they think they are. And that's yeah. the gap of self-awareness, I think. Yeah, or they don't know themselves enough, right? But you, I think you could feel who you are, but until you put an action behind it and you're like, mm, this was right, you don't know that. Yeah, you need you need the action in order to get the feedback. Right. And a lot of people aren't even willing product. to get the feedback. And that's where <laughs> we get the product. We are a product. <laughs> Yin yang. <laughs> I'm sorry, we got to cut this short. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed the conversation. I like don't even remember where it took turns anywhere. I enjoyed it, though. It was fun. Yeah, yeah it was fantastic. Um, we'll try to do this every time JL is back in New York. Hopefully, it gives us good weekly content, as well as we could probably make a lot of clips from this. So if you see us on Twitter or LinkedIn and you enjoy this, let us know in the comment section down below. Make sure you subscribe to the Big Content YouTube channel. Make sure you're following JL on Twitter. We will link his stuff down below. Uh, thank you, Will, for producing, editing, all that good sheesh. And uh, I believe Jack will be back in town next week. We move into the office the week after that, and then we'll start bringing. <laughs> you want to just cut Jack from yeah, the show so permanently? <laughs> see if he comes back. Um, and then we're going to start bringing on guests. So if you guys have any suggestions for people that you would want to see in the creator space, uh, we'll probably want to bring them on in person. So New York based creator space does not have to be someone in the football space or sports space at all. It could be any sort of creator. We're just looking to pick the brains of smart people. 
that don't care about judgment. As long as it's Gary V. Facts. Don't suggest anybody else. 